Okay, I'm back here again with James and Noisy Sarasota. Again, I apologize for any background noise we have going on or any dogs that might run by. Um, and in the last video, we were talking about waiting for this truck to pass by. We were waiting, we were talking about C programming, which is something I've dabbled in, wish I knew more about, and you're way more experienced and more knowledgeable on it than I am, compared to me, yeah. okay, which isn't saying much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we were talking about pointers, and I asked you about how, uh, how does it know uh, what block of memory is free for its right to for pointers, uh, and you gave a quick overview of it, but really that's something that the programmer the, 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 the fine details you don't have to worry about because that's pretty much taken care of by the operating system, I assume? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. And so like for a Unix operating system, um, you know, a fun thing to do is, so a couple fun experiments in C. Uh, you know, one thing is that you're, you're going to call the, your standard libraries all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, standard lib, standard IO. And uh, you can find those header files. Uh, you, you probably can find the source files online. I don't think the source files are on your operating system uh, I, because I think they're already compiled as, as lib files, which you can't read. It's, it's binary. But the, the header files exist. So you can find those header files. They're, mm -hmm. they're in, your, in your lib. I think with Debian there are source, I could be wrong about this, uh, like you can download, if you download the development, like yeah, you can get the it, source. I, I think it doesn't, doesn't but it bring down But even that aside, yeah, no. yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you can get the, this. oh, I mean, I don't know, for each operating system. Yeah. But, but all I'm saying is you can get the header files, and the header right. files is supposed to have all the, all the interesting public information about that, that extra functionality mm -hmm. that you're going to call. And um, so you can, you can actually look at that, and that's going to call another library file, uh, which, which is probably not anything you would ever call yourself. It's probably very system dependent, and you can look at that, and it's going to call another one and another one. And you can kind of go down the rabbit hole and see how something that's, that's the standard C libraries start calling more and more uh, operating specific um, uh, li library files. But um, another neat thing to do, too, is um, every time you compile mm -hmm. a, a C file. Uh, Which, by the way, what's your favorite compiler? Uh, I just use GCC. I don't know if I have a favorite. Favorite uh, yeah. you use? I just use GCC. Yeah, same uh, here. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know if there were favorites on that one, but yeah. Well, I mean, there are different ones, and I yeah. No, I know there are different. Like, yeah, you I can mean, use uh, G plus plus, right? Yeah, to you compile can, yeah. C, and it's yeah. not the same compiler, right? It's no, different. no, no, no. Yeah, and there there are things that are compile specific. Uh, mm -hmm. Each compiler does things a yes. little bit differently. And I've come across that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so um, so it could matter, but but for the most part. You shouldn't have to worry about that. But when you compile, the first thing that happens to the the first thing the compiler does is it runs something called the 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 pre processor. Okay. Uh, so what that does is, you know, every time you you run include or anytime you type include this library, what actually happens is the the pre processor actually grabs that file and injects it. And so before anything gets compiled. It converts it basically into one giant file. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun experiment. The next time you write something in C, if you want to see like every single line of code necessary for that to to run, uh, I believe it's CPP is the command on, okay. on on Linux operating system. Just run CPP on on your main file, and and maybe pipe it to less, you know, so you don't get <laughs> it to the screen, and just start going through all the stuff that got called, all that dependency chain, uh, you know, just. You know, don't obviously look for it to too long, you'll give yourself a headache. But just to see where all that stuff comes from. And it's very interesting. Uh, it's an interesting experiment. And uh, I actually knew somebody who, um, they, they were writing a program where um, they had to have all these configuration files. And they were writing a C program that would take those configuration files. And actually the first thing it would do is it would just take all these configuration files that included each other and it would run CPP on them and convert it to one file that he could start to parse. Mm. Uh, I mean. You know, it's just an interesting way to do it. Instead right. of having to define all the files, just one file would start including all the files. Right. So, anyways. Now, am I uh, correct? I believe I'm correct in saying this. Um, with uh, compiler, you're taking your C code, it's compiling it, and then it basically turns it into assembly. Correct? And then it assembles it? Am I, I, I feel like I've read that. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're getting in that territory where uh, I feel comfortable saying that is true among friends, 
but I don't know if I'm willing to publish it live to the web. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I read it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Because basically sure. everything has yeah, to be yeah, assembled sure. eventually. So you yeah. do compiler that compiles yeah, it into assembly, an assembly, yeah. and then it assembles it. We could, because the assembly language is like is is the computer specific. Yes, language. The, the different so hardware, that, yeah, different yeah. operating yeah. system. It all has to be written different. And then, and then that computer can then always take the assembly and convert it to the binary for that. For that correct you know, setup uh, from my understanding yeah because uh, I recently I think I mentioned the last video I was talking with a, a C programmer in my RC channel and I was talking he was telling me that you know in my videos I say that when you're programming for the most part if you're programming properly it shouldn't matter what operating system you're on or what hardware you're running on whether it's an arm processor or an x86 processor sure. uh, you use compile and I, I mean and I feel that's true for C, because uh, yep. everything I've tried to do, I've been able to do that. I've cross-compiled for Windows, yeah. I've uh, cross-compiled for ARM processors on my desktop. Um, maybe once you get more advanced than I am, but that's how I feel. Everything I've tried to accomplish, and I don't know what I'm doing. So I feel like someone who does, and he was like, it's not as easy as you may think it is. Oh, it's not easy. It's horribly <laughs> difficult in C. But I mean, that's that's ideal. Ideally, you should, mm -hmm. if you're going to write something like a C library, that's mm -hmm. an important C library, uh, that, that that's not uh, that's not operator uh, operating system specific. Mm -hmm. You should write it in a way that it can function on any. Right. Yeah. Well, my my argument to that is, there's basic parts of the program, and you can completely disagree with sure, this. Sure. Yeah. Um, that, that's just C, like calculating numbers, adding things right. together, creating variables, all that's going to be the same regardless. Right. The parts that become not compatible from operating system to operating system is when you're really trying to interact with that operating system itself, which I know you're always really running on top of it, so you're always interacting with it. But for example, the example that guy gave in the IRC channel was write a program that tells me how many characters wide the terminal screen is. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, I did. Yeah. And I sent you my second version of the code because yeah, the first sure. one was horrible and the <laughs> second one was horrible. I was waiting for you to give me a little better way of doing it. And yeah, I pretty much had to write code for both of them, but then put them in, in one program and then when I compiled... And, and you wrote that code well. I, I, sorry, I just didn't like the the places you put things. Sure. So I was just going to move things around, but the way you wrote it's perfect. So it was like five lines of yeah. code for how it's done in Windows, and yeah. five lines of code for how it's done in Linux, and then the compiler, when I'm compiling, it goes, oh, he's compiling for Linux, right. use this function. He's compiling for Windows, use this function. Right. And um, so, yeah, it's extra code, but lots of times you have libraries that do that right. sort of thing, and there might be a library that well, does that. Well, I mean, that. that's the point. And, and this kind of goes back to something else we were talking about. Like, mm -hmm. Everything you write should do one thing really well. Right. So if, if your objective is to write something that can determine the width of the terminal screen, mm -hmm. you can make a library file that, that can be compiled for any operating system, because mm -hmm. you wrote it flexible enough so that it can be co compiled for each. Unfortunately, the way C works is, once you compile it, it's compiled for that operating system. Right. But you but can you the write code. the source right. so that the way it compiles it is for the particular operating system you're mm -hmm. compiling for. Right. And then you can you can actually compile it as a library. And from then on, no matter what you write that you want to find the width of the of the terminal, you now have this one library you can call mm -hmm. that has been compiled in different ways so that the function with the same interface, the same function call, will return you the thing Right. That, that you want. And so again, my argument was to him, uh, and I think he was surprised at how fast I did that. It <laughs> took me a little bit. I really had no clue what I was doing. I Googled how to do it one way and how to do it the other. And then You're so put smart, it. Chris. Well, well, <laughs> I, he, I, well, he was trying to stump me is what he was yeah, trying no, to I do. I, yeah. And my kind of point is I don't know what I'm doing and I'm still able to accomplish <laughs> it. And it may not have been the best way, but now I have yeah. that. I put it in a header file, which may have not, I don't know if that's the best way to do it. I've right. never, never created a header file before that. And, but now, anytime I need to do that, I can just use that file I already wrote, right. and it right. just spits out a number. Right. But back to my original argument is, yeah, you're saying, oh, a different operating system, it has a different way of getting the different width. That's because you're interacting with a different program. You're interacting with the Windows terminal or the Linux shell, yeah. and it's like you're asking that program. So it's not that an operating system really thing, it's just that you're communicating with a different program. And so that's more of an aspect, I think, in that particular case. But the simpler ver uh, argument I have with that is with the um, very simple, 
you want to write a program that changes your window, your, your desktop background. Well, you have your Linux desktop background, and you might have different desktops. Although I think a lot of them have kind of merged in the way they do them. Or you have your. It's like, yeah, you're going to have to write different because you're interacting with a, pro, a different program. You're not just writing one plus one equals two. Right. Um, but again, you do one thing well, right? And so if you write something that changes your desktop, and maybe you can. You can start by writing something, well, oh, it only works if I'm running KDE. Mm -hmm. But then you say, okay, well, I know how to check what desktop is somewhere, because I know there's this place to check, and now I'm mm -hmm. going to write it so that it checks those two places, and, and or three places, or whatever it is. And then when you got all the, uh, uh, you know, when you have all the uh, Linux versions, you move, set, on, to you Windows, move on to Windows. And, and Mac. And so in theory, yeah, you could eventually write one program. I don't know why you'd need to write a program that changes the desktop. <laughs> yeah. But in our theoretical idea, you can write one program that does one thing really well. Is yeah. Most of it is basically you've written a lot of lines of code that just basically makes decisions based on Which checks. is kind of what libraries do. And absolutely, right? So yeah. anyway, so. again, I thank you for joining me today. I thank you guys for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description of this video if you're watching it on YouTube. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Not much I can do. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know it looks like a garden, but it's a noisy neighborhood. <laughs> Um, so, as we mentioned in the past, I mean, you've done a lot of programming, you've worked for a web design company, you've done a lot of Java. Okay, this is an introduction to filmsbychris.com. I'm Chris, that's Chris the K. That's me right there. My daughter Ember, and my wife Jennifer. We pretty much live in the swamps of Florida. I'm a firefighter by day, as well as by night. We work long hours. But that's not why you're here. You're here about the videos I put up on YouTube. These videos are mainly about computers and programming, which means most of my videos look something like this. And if that's what you're interested in, great. If not, that's all right. I do videos on other topics too, such as video editing, special effects, photo editing, 3D design, and music creation. If you are one of my viewers and you enjoy my videos, my Patreon page is a place where you can go to help support my videos. So I ask that you take the time to go to my Patreon page and look at the different levels of rewards you can receive for different levels of backing. There should be a link in the description of this video if you are watching it on YouTube. Otherwise, you can visit patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. And I thank you for your time and your support. Have a great day.